Hey everyone, welcome back to Public Speaking Online. Today we're going to be talking about verbal communication. So we're also going to be talking about strategies that engage an audience, as well as mindful and inclusive communication practices. Now, language can be used in a lot of powerful ways. It can create imagery, connect people, also divide them, and bolster a speaker's credibility. So let's start with the power to create imagery. Maybe you've heard the phrase, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? I mean, we all have. Well, what happens when there's no picture, but only your words? Well, then it's your job, the speaker, to provide those thousand words that creates the same level of creative imagery for your audience. Well, let's think about our five senses for a second. Sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste. And the ways that we can use strategic, creative, and really descriptive language to engage our listeners' senses. Now, we'll cover more of this, but I want you to think about the ways that we can use language to move audiences, maybe to motivate them, to encourage them, or even discourage our audience to get them super pumped up or completely turn them off or away. These are all ways that demonstrate how language is so powerful. So we've already talked about the way that language can be used to create imagery. Here are then the strategies that we can use to create that imagery. So for example, a metaphor, right? Well, what is a metaphor? I kind of remember, but I did not do very well on my GREs. So let's go ahead and think back to early English class. A metaphor is the pairing of two independent ideas with the word is in between them. So for example, ignorance is a closed door. Now it's one thing to say that ignorance represents closed-mindedness, but the use of a metaphor here that door helps paint that vivid, detailed picture that our listeners can interpret. And it engages our senses by creating a visual, maybe you use a slide, um, but maybe even a sound, right, as we think about the shutting off or closing of a door. Now, a simile is another strategy, and it differs from a metaphor in that it uses the word as to connect two separate ideas. So for example, you are as sharp as a razor. Personification is another. It's a practice of giving human-like qualities to non-human objects or nouns. So um, one of my favorites, it's a personal example, but I always tell my daughter to look outside when the wind is blowing because she can see the trees dancing. I think her confused look is probably a testament to my parenting. Hyperbole is the extreme exaggeration of something in order to emphasize conditions or value qualities of a particular experience. So you could say, I'm really tired, or you could say, I could sleep for a year. Repetition. Powerful speakers tend to engage in repetition, but why? Well, one, it helps commit things to memory, for example, through alliteration. Now, alliteration is when an audience arranges their speech topics, their content, maybe even the words of their speeches um, during the transitions by using the same letters or sounds. I'm going to totally mess this up. She sells seashells by the seashore, right? Say that 10 times faster, whatever other one reminds you of the same type of thing. Now, alliteration and repetition is also a common business practice. Think about, for example, a sales manager, right, who's trying to develop like a team slogan or training tools. So for Jaguar, it's don't dream it, drive it, or Intel inside. Um, you never put a better bit of butter on your knife. That's from Country Life Butter. 
So if you haven't already, pause on this slide and take a moment to complete the chart using some examples of your own so that these linguistic strategies really come to life as you work to create imagery. And here's another practice. Take any one of the following three sentences that you see here and in its place, create a word picture for your audience. So one example might be that you could say um, the food tastes great. Or you could create a truly powerful and sensory experience for your audience by saying instead, now imagine yourself on a Greek island. The sun is beating down and your legs are outstretched as you relax deeper into your lounge chair. Suddenly the rich aroma of fresh baked pita bread comes by with lemony olive oil and spiced chicken which fills the air. You know it's time for lunch. So now it's your turn. Give one of these a try. And remember, you will be picking one to share in your discussion board this week. So then let's take a step back and talk really quick about mindful speaking. Knowing the origins, history, and meaning of our language has power to shape listener perceptions, but also to empower you as a speaker to consider all the various ways our language can be interpreted. Etymology, for example, is the study of word origin. So did you know that the Greek word androgen loosely translates to English as man? It's appropriate then that we have the word androgen when we refer to male sex hormones. The origins of the word estrogen, however, loosely translates into a very different word, frenzied. Quite a difference, don't you think? Now we can think about denotation or the dictionary definition of something. Now, pardon my language in advance because I'm using this to prove a point, but if you were to look up the word faggot in the dictionary, chances are you would see it defined as a bundle of sticks. But then how did that word morph into the derogatory term that it has become now, perhaps you already know, but during Nazi Germany, men who were suspected of being homo homosexuals were actually brought into the town centers and quite literally um, burned at the stake. Knowing the history, origin, and the roots of our language is increasingly important as we start to speak to more global and diverse audiences. Much of our current vernacular even has roots in early medical terminology, such as the term idiot, moron, or imbecile. Did you know that those were late 18th century terms that they used to medically refer to one's IQ level? Or how about this one? Maybe you've heard the phrase, no can do. Now, that's a phrase that originated in the United States during the time of early Chinese immigration, and it was actually used as a derogatory and oppressive phrase to make fun of the way that native Chinese speakers made attempts to learn English. So it's important to take a moment, really is what I'm saying, and research the background, roots, and origin of certain words. And if you want a little fun homework, do it yourself. Take the word uppity, crackhead or what it means to use PC language, and then find out how these terms have evolved since their early inception. As you do, you will find that many English phrases have complicated roots in racial relations, social stigma, and even political correctness. Finally, it's important to think about the ways that words carry connotations or their cultural and contextual definitions, and how these vary from their literal or dictionary ones. Why? Well, imagine that you are speaking to an audience with a second, third, or even fourth language speaker in the crowd. The translation of the word bitch, classic example, I know, would carry a very different literal definition from its slang connotation. 
Now, hopefully you're not saying that word in a speech anyway, right? We can think about that as a trigger word, for example, for some. What are trigger words and what makes them trigger some? Trigger words are basically those that elicit really strong emotional reactions from individuals. And oftentimes they come from having had a negative past experience or trauma of some kind. Trigger phrases in my family, um, if I can be real for just a moment, include jokes or phrases around suicide. Um, I'm really sad to say this, uh, but just about two years ago, uh, my uncle ended up taking his life. And ever since this really deeply troubling family experience, I've found that I'm a little more sensitive to um, jokes or phrases about suicide. So when someone says like, oh, I just want to die or I just want to kill myself, even in jest, um, I pick up on that, right? And it kind of has a, a weird resonation within, within me. For some, it's very different. Maybe it's the N-word, the C-word, the F-word. And for others, it could be language around fat shaming or gender identity, race or social economic status, um, mental wellness, and the like. I even had a student once who said that her trigger word was starving. And when we asked her to talk a little bit more about that, she explained that she was, in fact, a refugee and her family had, by definition, experienced true starvation. This moves us then to the importance of being inclusive. Let's say, for example, that there's someone in our audience who was in a wheelchair. Well, it would not be wise to use phrases um, that include mobile terms. For example, okay, audience, imagine yourself walking around. Inclusivity is really language that is sensitive to, mindful of, appreciative, honoring, and respectful of all of our experiences and our various identity backgrounds. Now, I know that that can seem like a challenge, even a daunting or a time-consuming process. And one time, I even had a student who said, why would I even bother when everything I say could potentially offend someone in the first place? And I get that. I understand the sentiment, but also let me suggest that as a public speaker, it is your ethical responsibility to choose language and design your messages around your audience. I would also say that it's not about changing who you are or your entire language use. It's really about just making some very small adjustments to your speech that I hope you've learned can have a really powerful impact. So to conclude, Let's remember, language is powerful and carries a lot of cultural, political, and personal meanings for us all. It's important to be mindful of potential and even well-intentioned exclusive language terms and phrases when preparing a, a speech. So take some time. Think about what you're going to say and consider your audience. Thank you.